Hello, Tor Lacey here with a reading from the chapter Crustal Deformation and Earthquakes from the textbook Introduction to Geology, free textbook for college level introductory geology courses from Salt Lake Community College. The photograph here is showing an example of normal faulting in an outcrop from the Pennsylvanian Honaker Trail Formation near Moab, Utah, Pennsylvania being from the geologic time scale, indicating the approximate age of the rock of the formation that has been faulted. And we see the uh, outcrop has been faulted in several places, as evidenced by the offset strata. By the end of this chapter, students should be able to. I will read the learning objectives that pertain to the reading sections I've assigned to you. Identify the three major types of stress. Name and describe different fold types. Differentiate the three major fault types and describe their associated movements. Crustal deformation occurs when applied forces exceed the eternal strength of rocks, physically changing their shapes. These forces are called stress, and the physical changes they create are called strain. Forces involved in tectonic processes, as well as gravity and igneous pluton emplacement, produce strains in rock that include folds, fractures, and faults. When rock experiences large amounts of shear stress and breaks with rapid brittle deformation, energy is released in the form of seismic waves, commonly known as an earthquake. Stress and strain. Stress is the force exerted per unit area and strain is the physical change that results in response to that force. When applied stress is greater than the internal strength of rock, strain results in the form of deformation of the rock caused by the stress. Strain in rocks can be represented as a change in rock volume and or rock shape, as well as fracturing the rock. There are three types of stress, tensional, compressional, and shear. Tensional stress involves forces pulling in opposite directions, which results in strain that stretches and thins rock. Compressional stress involves forces pushing together, and compressional strain shows up as rock folding and thickening. Shear stress involves transverse forces. The strain shows up as opposing blocks or regions of material moving past each other. The table shows types of stress and resulting strain. There's a quiz here that you should uh, take a moment to do as well. Deformation. The illustration here is a graph plotting stress versus strain. If you feel uh, motivated, take a look at this and think it through. It is, uh, it is helpful, but I'm just going to skip over that for now and focus on the introductory paragraph here. When rocks are stressed, the resulting strain can be elastic, ductile, or brittle. This generally, this change is generally called deformation. Elastic deformation is strain that is reversible after a stress is released. For example, when you stretch a rubber band, it elastically return, returns to its original shape after you release it. Ductile deformation occurs when enough stress is applied to a material that the change in its shape are permanent and the material is no longer able to revert to its original shape. For example, if you bend a metal bar too far, it can be permanently bent out of shape. The point at which elastic deformation is surpassed and strain becomes permanent is called the yield point. In the figure, yield point is where the line transitions from elastic deformation to ductile deformation, the end of the dashed line. Brittle deformation is another critical point of no return when rock integrity fails and the rock fractures under increasing stress. All right, I'm skipping this paragraph here. You can look at this chart, which um, is beneficial, and take the quiz. I'm skipping over geologic maps. Cross sections we've talked a little bit about already. Strike and dip, I'm going to skip over that. Continue to scroll down to folds. Geologic folds are layers of rock that are curved or bent by ductile deformation. 
Folds are most commonly formed by compressional forces at depth, where hotter temperatures and higher confining pressures allow ductile deformation to occur. This illustration here is a model of an anticline. The oldest beds are in the center and the youngest on the outside, which should make sense as this agrees with the law or principle of superposition. And we see these big arrows on the outside indicating compressional stress deforming the rock through ductile deformation, bending it into an anticline. I'm going to scroll down to anticline. Anticlines are arch-like or A-shaped folds that are convex upwards in shape. They have downward curving limbs and beds that dip down and away from the central fold axis. In anticlines, the oldest strata are in the center of the fold along the axis and the younger beds are on the outside. Since geologic maps show the intersection of surface topography with underlying geologic structures, an anticline on a geologic map can be identified by both the attitude of the strata forming the fold and the older age of rocks inside the fold. Now, you don't need to know the last uh, sentence that I read there, but um, this is actually pretty important and fun to think about if you get further into your geologic studies. So don't worry about that so much. I'm going to skip the rest of that paragraph and talk very quickly about synclines. There's a short video here that I would encourage you to watch regarding that. Uh, synclines are trough-like or U-shaped folds that are concave upward in shape such as we see here in the still from the video. They have beds that dip down and in toward the central fold axis. In synclines, older rocks are on the outside of the fold, and the youngest rocks are on the inside of the fold axis. I'm going to skip monocline and dome and basin and scroll down to faults. Faults are the places in the crust where brittle deformation occurs as two blocks of rocks move relative to one another. Normal and reverse faults display vertical, also known as dip-slip motion. Dip-slip motion consists of relative up and down movement along a dipping fault between two blocks, the hanging wall and the foot wall. In a dip-slip system, the foot wall is below the fault plane and the hanging wall is above the fault plane. A good way to remember this is to imagine a mine tunnel running along the fault. The hanging wall would be where the miner would hang a lantern, and the foot wall would be at the miner's feet. So we see that here in this simple block diagram. The foot wall block is the, fault, is the block of rock below or on the lower side of the fault surface, the hanging wall block being above the fault surface. We also see here a fault scarp. Scrolling down here to normal faults. Normal faults move by vertical motion where the hanging wall block moves downward relative to the foot wall along the dip of the fault. Normal faults are created by tensional forces in the crust. Ten uh, normal faults and tensional forces or tensional stresses commonly occur at divergent plate boundaries where the crust is being stretched by tensional stresses. Examples of normal faults in Utah are the Wasatch Fault, the Hurricane Fault, and other faults bound in the valleys of the Basin Range province. So this illustration here, uh, illustration I should say this photograph here, is showing us a good example of a normal fault. Uh, a normal fault being here, and you can see that this um, mauve colored bed has been offset as the hanging wall block moved downward along the fault. I'm going to scroll down to reverse faults. In reverse faults, compressional forces cause the hanging wall to move up relative to the foot wall. A thrust fault is a reverse fault where the fault plane has a low dip angle of less than 45 degrees. Okay, you don't need to worry about that, but let's take a moment to look at the reverse fault on this uh, block diagram illustration showing us the hanging wall has slid upwards along the fault plane. OK, 
And I use this uh, photograph in my lecture. And then we have here strike slip faults. Strike slip faults have side to side motion. Strike slip faults are most commonly associated with transform plate boundaries and are prevalent, prevalent in transform fracture zones along the mid ocean ridge. In pure strike slip motion, fault blocks on either side of the fault do not move up or down relative to each other, rather move laterally, side to side. The direction of strike slip movement is determined by an observer standing on a block on one side of the fault. If the block on the opposing side of the vault moves left relative to the, to the observer's block. It is called sinistral motion. I would refer to that as left lateral motion. If the opposing block moves right, it is dextral motion. I would refer to that as right lateral motion or right lateral strike slip fault. And here's a little video about strike slip faults. Lastly, take a moment to um, watch this video here and take the quiz. That's it for this reading. Thank you for your attention.